I am standing here wondering what you're all thinking right now. I imagine you're probably thinking what a great couple of days you've had, inspiring talks you've heard, the people that you've met, or maybe you're thinking about all the work that you've got to do when you go back to the office on Monday. Um, or maybe you're thinking about going to the pub or on the boat trip. I bet what you're not thinking is, ooh, wouldn't it be a kind of good, inspiring end to the conference <laughs> to sit and listen to a talk about tech debt, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I care passionately about tech debt, um, but I'm not sure that everybody else agrees with me. Um, and when uh, Steve told me that I was going to be doing this slot, I was, I have to say, I was quite stressed. Um, and I kind of started thinking about why you should care about tech debt, especially in this slot. And I thought engineers cry about it and they do it in secret. Product managers' eyes glaze over when you start talking about it. CTOs have sleepless nights thinking about it and worrying about it. We're like, tech debt really is, isn't it, the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody knows it's there. And I thought, but yet your business depends on you caring about tech debt and doing something about it. So it came to me that this was actually a golden opportunity for me to get you all in a room, captive audience, and try and persuade you to care about tech debt as well. So yes, we are going to talk about tech debt. And the aim of this talk is to convince you the success of your business cares about, is, depends on everybody, not just the engineers, caring about tech debt. And I want to convince you that you should do something about it. And I'm going to give you some tools to think about how you might uh, sustainably tackle your tech debt. Um, and this is kind of roughly the shape of what we're going to talk about. The first half is going to be a bit miserable. It's going to be talk about being in debt. And the second half is going to be hopefully a bit more positive. We're going to talk about getting out of debt. But first of all, a little bit about me. I'm Sally, I am an engineering manager. I like to swim in stupid places. Uh, this is me swimming in the Arctic Circle in February in Sweden. Um, uh, and I've been a manager in tech for around eight years. Um, and the last three companies that I've been working in have been fast moving startups. Each of these companies has been less than six years old. Each of these companies have been working in really competitive industries where they've been working super fast to try and uh, beat their competitors and add value to their customers. And each of these companies, even though they've been less than six years old, have been, uh, um, I was gonna say riddled, but massively burdened um, by technical debt that has slowed them down and impacted their rate of delivery. And the last two of these companies that I've worked with, have, I've had the job of trying to kind of find a sustainable way of managing tech debt. Oh, the wrong side. <laughs> That's what nerves does to you. Okay, so um, this is Accurex. This is the company that I work um, at at the moment. Um, that picture was taken last year. Um, we're probably about double that size now. Um, Accurex is a healthcare startup. We make communication tools for uh, GPs um, and for now the secondary healthcare as well. Um, our customer is, our primary customer is the NHS. Um, and you can imagine since COVID, we've been pretty busy. So, um, just before COVID started, we, um, our tool, our communication tool was um, adopted in 30% of GPs practices in England and Wales. And by the end of uh, the pandemic, two years later, we're now in 97% of GPs practices. And as well as that, we built the um, NHS COVID vaccination tool for GPs, for booking. 
So it's kind of been a fast paced couple of years and kind of this in, in the context of this talk is, is important. Um, and I joined in January of this year and the first job that landed on my desk as an engineering manager as well as looking after engineers was the job of trying to um, find a way to sustainably manage our tech debt. And I'm going to share the learnings with you here today of, of that. Um, so first of all, uh, that was the introduction. We're going to go into the first bit, which is talking about being in debt. What is technical debt? So, uh, technical debt is the implied cost of additional rework caused by choosing an easy limited solution now instead of using a better approach that would uh, take longer. Okay, so what does this, that really mean? Um, how many of you um, have had a student loan? Good. Uh, how many of you are still in debt? Just probably quite a few. Um, when you were considering going to university, did you think, I don't know, I don't really want to go to university now. I think I'll spend a few years trying to save up £40,000. And then when I've got all the money, I'll go then. Right? I, I don't think anybody did that, did they? Um, uh, you borrow money because you want a thing and you want it fast. And so you take out a loan and you get the thing. And then you realise that you're going to have to pay that loan back over time, right? That's what loans are for. Um, you're basically borrowing from your future self um, for kind of a fast thing now. Tech debt is the same. You're in a company, you're building products, you want to kind of get to the market fast because you want to deliver to your customers quickly before your competitors. And so you decide to make a trade-off and not build the perfect solution. And that is essentially the same, essentially the same as a, a money debt, um, as normal debt. Um, you're borrowing from your future self to get something fast now. You make a trade-off. You choose fast over perfect. And, and future you is going to go, have to go back and refactor your code. And that is what we would call tech debt. But bear in mind, with software delivery, you're not just taking out one loan. You're kind of going to take a loan out every time you build some software, you write some code. And so you'll be gathering up debt after debt after debt after debt. And accruing technical debt is even more um, difficult in a company that's fast moving. The faster you move to be competitive, the more experiments and change, the more unpredictability, the less time to think, the more you're going to kind of be in debt as you're going along. And then the less time you're going to have to pay back your original debt. And so it just gets worse and worse and worse as you accumulate debt. Now I'm talking about kind of building things quickly. Um, and that is not the same as building things badly. I don't think, I don't want you to think that when I'm talking about tech debt, I'm kind of, you're imagining a whole bunch of engineers just bashing out really bad code. That's not what I'm talking about. In fact, when I um, was on the beach last night, I was talking to somebody and they said, great, we, you know, we've got this legacy system that's got a whole bunch of technical debt. Um, and we're building a new system. And, that, and I'm really interested to come and kind of hear your talk um, because um, we don't want to accrue any te technical debt. So um, I hope you're going to give us lots of tips about how not to accrue technical debt in the first place. I'm really sorry to disappoint you. That is not what I'm going to do. That is not what this talk is about. Accumulating technical debt is inevitable if you want to move fast to market and beat your competitors. Um, it's inevitable. Um, and it's a trade-off. And, and, and there are lots of positives to this approach because if you kind of spent all your time building perfect software, you would basically not be in business, right? It sounds like I'm only really talking about code here. Um, and people equate kind of technical debt with kind of um, uh, refactoring and kind of code. But actually, there are many, many different types of technical debt. 
Um, and uh, uh, they're all a result of prioritizing fast over perfect. And I'm going to just have a kind of quick romp through a few different types of technical debt. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just kind of a few different types so we can kind of frame the some of the problems. Code or application debt, we've already talked about. Code is about, uh, it, this is code that is imperfect, perhaps. It's kind of overly complex. It is uh, inconsistent. It has duplication. It's hard to understand. It's hard to read or it's poorly documented. And the kind of consequences of kind of this kind of code debt could be um, uh, development and maintenance slows down, engineers can be demoralized or frustrated. Then we've got kind of design or architecture debt, uh, which is not thinking about the architecture or the structure of your system or not taking time after the event to kind of make changes as your product evolves. And the consequences of this are kind of systems that are kind of too complex uh, and can't be adequately managed or kind of single points of failure that cause outages. Testing debt, lack of unit tests, integration tests or end-to-end -end tests. Consequences of this can be more bugs. Another consequence can be poor testing can lead to uh, lack of confidence in engineers, which can in turn lead to bundling up of kind of uh, your uh, pull request, your, uh, uh, um, your code, which can in turn lead to kind of bundling more software out at once, which can uh, mean uh, more risk, which can also mean more bugs. And incidentally, lack of confidence in your testing and your testing framework can mean that your engineers are less likely to work on your tech debt because that can have added complexity and they kind of don't feel confident in, in kind of refactoring. Um, and so you then mean that means that you can then uh, um, incur more debt or, or not get on top of your debt. Tooling debt, not keeping your libraries, frameworks and uh, tools up to, debt, up to date because you haven't got time. This can mean that you can't take advantage of new features in new versions of your tools. It can also mean that your versions of your tools and frameworks can reach end of life, which can mean that you don't have the latest security patches, which can mean really kind of serious things for your business. Reliability and performance debt. Uh, not uh, uh, finding time to think about performance or reliability, um, which can mean a bad customer experience, um, and your business's ability to scale is also uh, um, questioned. And then finally, knowledge debt and skills debt. Um, a really interesting one, a lack of useful uh, documentation, um, uh, technical documentation, which can mean it's hard for new employees to onboard, and it can mean that junior engineers don't have confidence to build the right thing. And skills debt can mean um, that you have the kind of wrong balance of engineers in your organization, and that can be either too many new engineers or too many junior engineers. And this can also kind of lead to kind of slowing down in your ability to develop solutions for your customers. That's the end of my short list. Um, why are all these important? Because all of these are consequences of moving too fast, if you think about it, so that you don't have time to think or plan ahead. You don't have time to make optimal decisions. You don't have time to change or uh, refine your ideas. OK, how do you know when you're in debt? So when I first kind of decided to do this talk, I kind of put a thing out on Twitter and said, I'm doing a talk about tech debt. What do people want to know? And a whole bunch of people got back to me and said, oh, we want to know how you measure technical debt. And I was like, OK, cool, 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 cool. Um, I started uh, looking on the internet to see how other people measured tech debt. And I kind of read a whole bunch of interesting articles about um, cyclomatic complexity and code coverage and the squale method. I've got no idea if I pronounced that correctly, and I have no idea what it is. But it sounds impressive. Um, and um, Basically, there are a whole bunch of tools out there that you can use to measure um, your technical debt. And I was like, OK, so I'm going to put some slides together and tell people about these. And then I kind of thought, hang on, this, this doesn't ring true with me. I've never used any of these uh, methods for measuring whether I'm in tech debt. Because the truth is, you know when you're in tech debt. I'm going to give you a few examples of how you might know. 
Let me introduce you to Leon. Leon is a junior engineer. Leon has been working on a relatively straightforward feature, which should have taken him a couple of days. But every day he says in stand up, I'm almost finished, I'm almost finished. And he finally gets it finished at the end of the week. And um, his tech lead turns around to Leon uh, and you know, has a one-to-one -one -one with him because he wants to kind of get to the bottom of why it took Leon um, a week to deliver this feature, thinking there might be an opportunity for him to give him, you know, kind of help him uh, with some learnings. And Leon turned around to him and said, oh, no, no, the, um, the feature took me uh, a day to write. That was relatively straightforward. He said, but I had a real problem with the unit tests. Um, one unit test took me three days to write. That's tech debt. Let me introduce you to Anna. Um, Anna is a senior engineer. Anna has been at her company for four years. Uh, since, when, since the company was kind of pretty small, um, they were a fast-moving company. Um, and Anna was relatively junior at that time, but she kind of had a good hand in building most of the system for the company. Um, Anna made some questionable coding and design decisions at that time because she was junior and they were moving fast. Now, four years down the line, Anna is uh, confronted daily by those choices that she made, and so are her team. And they're all uh, um, having to kind of bear the consequences of the choices that she made. Now, Anna follows the um, Girl Scouts code of cleaning up and um, likes to be able to kind of tidy up her code as she goes. But Anna doesn't have any time to do that, or not time that is budgeted for. So every time Anna goes into a um, planning session, uh, she takes a feature that she's supposed to be estimating and she adds two days on to her estimate so that she has time to quietly refactor where nobody's looking. That's tech debt for you right there. Uh, let me introduce you to Christina. Christina is a user help manager and Christina's pretty pissed off um, today, Christina has had a whole barrage of complaints from users. Um, a team has uh, shipped a, a feature to production, and that, sh that feature has um, uh, broken a critical uh, feature of um, their product, and none of the customers can use it, and they've got in touch with uh, Christina to tell her. So Christina's been on Slack, for the last two hours, trying to get in touch with the team who are responsible for this feature. The team are all in the pub. And Christina is wondering why the team shipped uh, something to production and then went off to the pub. I'm sure Steve's going to have to say something about this. but um, She's wondering why they've all gone off to the pub when they've just released the feature to production. Um, and then she does a bit more investigation and she realizes that the feature um, that is broken um, was caused by a completely different product team uh, doing a release of a completely different feature in an entirely unrelated part of the product. Neither of those two teams who, who uh, owned those two features had any idea that they shared some common code and that this would be the impact of the feature. That's tech debt for you right there. And finally, this is Sally. Uh, she is an engineering manager. Sally has been working with a team that have been uh, having some problems. The team has been delivering really slowly and all the engineers are really grumpy and frustrated. So Sally has been asked to draft in Tom, who is a senior engineer at the company, to go and work with that team and help them improve the pace of their delivery. Uh, Tom is uh, a bit more wily and he goes to talk to Olu, who is in the team that's not performing and asks Olu what the deal is. Olu turns around to him and says, this team is a nightmare. The code base is terrible. Everybody's grumpy and miserable. Run for the hills, Tom. Uh, Tom, not one to not voice his opinions, turns around to Sally and refuses to go and join the team. Um, he says that he doesn't want to, and he doesn't want to have six months of misery working on a nightmare code base with a product which is uh, critical to the business. That's tech debt right there. So raise your hands, please, 
if you've ever experienced anything like any of these scenarios in your time. <laughs> right, and I've seen all of these in about the last nine months. Um, these, example, these are examples that tell you that your tech debt is spiraling out of control. You don't need to measure cyclomatic complexity and you don't need to measure the swale method, whatever it is. Your engineers know it, your product managers know it, your business leaders probably know it too. You just need your ears and eyes to listen and see what's going on around you because tech debt is a business problem, not a technical problem. You know that you've got a problem because the speed of your delivery becomes affected, your estimates are bad, you don't understand your velocity, you're slow to ship to market, your rivals deliver value to your customers before you do. Your reputation becomes tarnished. There are increasing numbers of bugs, you suffer outages, your product's unreliable, your security is compromised, and your customers are pissed off. You start to have attrition. Your engineers are demoralized and annoyed. Your new engineers are difficult to onboard. There are whole areas of your product that nobody wants to work on, and it's difficult to retain talent. You're in debt, and it's time to take action. Right, part two. That was a miserable bit. Now, hopefully, this bit is a bit more positive. All right, how to pay back your debt. First of all, the first thing you can do whenever you're in debt, right, whether it's in kind of financial debt or any other debt, is to face up to all the debts that you have. Make a long list of everything you owe. Get everybody in your business involved in making that list. Just as there are multiple different types of tech debt, there are also multiple different people who can spot different types of tech debt. So everybody will have something different to say. Your engineers will know about the code. They'll know where the complexity lies. They know which areas will need to be refactored. Your senior engineers will have a strategic view of what your architectural changes need to be. Your new starters will know where your documentation is lacking. Your testers and your user help will know where the bugs are and your um, uh, DevOps team or your kind of DevTools team will know about your infrastructure and will know uh, what tools need to be updated. Ask them all, create a long list. This is a bit of a weird one, but bear with me. We wanted to reframe the problem of tech debt because Words are important, right? Um, we wanted to get everybody behind our project of um, working on tech debt, but it sounded like a bit of a, well, a bit of a bummer, really, isn't it? Um, if I asked you to, if you wanted a hundred pounds, you wanted to pay off pay off some debts, or you wanted to kind of invest it in the future, most people would go, yeah, I want to invest it in the future. I said, we changed from talking about tech debt, and we started calling it tech investment because everybody wants to invest in the future. Okay, so we had our long list of uh, um, tech debt. We had rebranded ourselves to kind of talking about tech investment. Um, then we wanted to kind of try and find the right method to pay back our debt, to work on our investments. Um, there are kind of multiple different ways that you can pay it back. Um, and never want to not stretch a metaphor to complete breaking point. Um, there are a few here, although I couldn't think of one for dedicated teams, so sorry about that. Um, One-off repayments, um, dedicated teams, ad hoc repayments, and sustainable repayments. We're going to have a look at each one of these with some pros and cons. Um, so the first one you could use to kind of tackle your tech investment list is to kind of have one-off repayments, right? So this is like your debt bash where everybody kind of, oh, somebody called it earlier on, called it a break. I can't remember who that was, a kind of break week um, where you kind of down tools, you stop working on your kind of product work and you just have everybody in the room working on your kind of tech investment. Um, and this has pros and cons. 
uh, has, you know, you have a bit of a blitz spirit. You kind of, everybody's, nobody's working on product work. You've got a whole long list of tech investment and, and everybody's doing it together. So um, people kind of uh, enjoy that. The idea of all kind of pulling together and working on the same project. Uh, cross team collaboration, kind of when we've done this, when I've seen this work in the past, obviously it means that everybody in the organization is working on your tech investment. You get to work with people from other teams. It's quite fun. People enjoy it. And you can actually get quite a lot done. Um, if everybody downs tools, downs tools for a week, um, you can get through quite a lot of your list. What are the cons? In reality, this happens like once a year or twice a year maximum, right? So even though you can get quite a lot done in a week, you're not going to be doing it more than once, twice a year. You're not actually going to get through as much as you think you are. Dedicated teams. By this, I mean uh, having all your product teams and taking a few engineers and taking them off um, their projects and sitting them in a team where all they do is uh, manage their tech debt. And you could do that with people from your in-house team, or you could have it, uh, you could do it with people um, uh, who are contractors, either of those work, and both I've seen both models. Pros and cons. It doesn't interrupt delivery. So you've got all your teams working every week on their product, and you've got this team squirreled away over here who are just doing tech debt, tech investment. Um, uh, it doesn't impact your product, um, especially if you've got contractors in to do it. That's good. They don't have any context switching. So that can be a problem, obviously, for if you're working on a bit of uh, um, product uh, work here and a bit of tech investment here. You have um, a lot of context switching. But with this, if all you're doing is tech investment, you can be very focused and productive. And you can deliver quite large scale projects if you work in this model with a team who are kind of purely dedicated to doing it. That is good. There are some cons, though. People don't want to do it. Your engineers don't want to do it. Your contractors don't want to do it either, by the way. People go into um, product companies because they want to work on products, because they want to deliver value to customers. They certainly don't join a product company to spend six months working in a team doing refactoring. This model quite often uses, kind of sucks off quite a lot of your senior, oh, anyway, that's not a good thing to say, is it? it um, <laughs> siphons off, <laughs> siphons off a lot of your senior engineers. <laughs> Um, siphons off a lot of your senior engineers because, you know, inherently um, working on kind of refactoring and tech investment is difficult and complex work with a lot of moving pieces and a lot of interdependencies. Um, you will generally want your um, senior engineers to be doing that. And so um, you'll have to move them away from other teams and that will have an impact. Um, an interesting one with this is that your, um, the engineers who are not working on your tech investment won't learn the pain points of having to um, do this kind of tech investment work. So they won't know what their kind of future mistakes might be, if you like. So there's no learning for the people who aren't doing it. And if you have contractors doing it, that's a kind of a good solution somehow. But you're always going to need somebody who's a senior engineer in your team to look after your um, contractors. They're probably going to have to write all of the kind of tickets and stories. And they're definitely going to have to review um, uh, the code of the, of the contractors as well. So it might not be quite as kind of um, easy and straightforward as, it, as you think it is. And then finally, ad hoc payments. And this is where I was, uh, this is where Accurex was when I joined at the beginning of the year. Um, we had a big backlog of tech investments. We really wanted to work on it. Um, and um, we kind of just said to our engineers, um, here's the backlog of tech investments. Pick some stuff up when you've got some time. That would be great. And um, we really want you to do it. We appreciate it. Um, and um, uh, we said, you know, we've got some guild days. So we have a kind of concept of guilds where all the back end engineers or all the front end engineers can have a day together and kind of work on something. We're like, you can use your guild days to do some tech investment if you want to. But it wasn't really working for us. We weren't going to get getting through much. Pros and cons. Um, uh, it was kind of flexible um, and efficient. 
Um, you know, you could be an engineer who was kind of working on a feature. You had a kind of big PR that was being reviewed. You didn't have anything to do for the day. So you could just pick up a small ticket from our tech investment list and work on it. It was kind of efficient use of time. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe somebody was doing some, sort of dis your product team was doing some discovery work. So you had a couple of days. That was kind of good. Um, it's good again for cross-team collaboration. When we had the guilds, they could, could, people could work together on a bit of tech investment. Um, that was nice. But there were kind of quite a few cons with this as well. As I said before, um, everybody works in a kind of product company because they want to deliver value to customers. Um, and uh, as a product company, you're, you know, that is the thing by which you're measured, right? Everybody wants to deliver value to, uh, to customers. Um, if you're an engineer and you've got a piece of tech investment here and you've got a feature here, you're always going to choose delivering the feature over delivering the tech investment because that's what your product manager wants, that's what your, you know, your CEO wants, and that's what you want, in fact. So we found that the kind of tech investments were just kept being kind of put to the bottom of the pile. Um, schedule clashes. So when we had those kind of engineers happily working in guilds to kind of deliver tech investment together, the reality was that they could never find time that they were both free. Um, so the, again, those things just kind of kept being pushed backwards and backwards. And then there's a kind of transparency problem as well. Um, you know, an engineer might be working, um, you know, on a feature and waiting for a review and then, but they were working on a tech investment ticket, but nobody knew Nobody in their product team knew what they were doing. And the product managers would come up to us and go, what is that engineer doing? What have they been doing all week? Um, so, because nobody knew what they were doing. And because it was an ad, ad hoc nature of this, um, we couldn't ever deliver any big investments, actually. Um, they were all kind of very small pieces. So it wasn't working. We weren't getting through enough. We had to have another plan. We came across the idea, came upon the idea of sustainable repayments. And what that really meant was that we decided to take our tech investments and embed them in product teams and make the whole of the product teams, everybody in the product team responsible for delivering those tech investments continuously all through cycle, all through the next cycle. Everybody in the company was kind of tasked or charged with the responsibility of delivering them. And how do we do that? It was a four-step, very compressed four-step process. Uh, we got buy-in from senior stakeholders. We embedded the tech investment in the teams. Uh, we empowered the teams to deliver it, and we kind of celebrated our success. I'm going to go through all of them step by step. So step one. This was a fundamental step, getting buy-in from our senior leadership. And um, it sounds very straightforward. Do not underestimate how long this took. Um, in fact, I wasn't massively involved with this process of kind of persuading the senior leadership, given that I'd only been at the company for one month. Um, but it was very easy because my boss, who's the VP of engineering, was like really, really keen that we get this moving. Um, uh, there were plenty of others, even though he was very keen, there were plenty of other stakeholders that were very doubtful, our CTO, um, our chief product officer, or VP of engineering, a VP of uh, product, uh, and our CEO all needed to be persuaded that this was a good way of working. So what do we do? We describe the problem, not in uh, technical language, but in business language, using those kind of key business problems that I talked about. So um, uh, slowness of delivery, attrition, and uh, the third one, which is uh, yeah, bugs and outages and reputational damage. So we explained that all of that tech investment would uh, cause the problems in those areas. Then we used our prioritized list of tech investment to show them the scale of the problem. And we took those kind of line items of tech investment and we, we kind of had, um, uh, um, what's the word? Estimated how long each one of those kind of tech investments would take to, um, uh, to, to kind of to work on. But we also estimated the impact they would have of not working on them. And we took that to our senior leadership. And they agreed that we had to do this plan, which was great um, in principle. Um, and then the next thing we had to do was agree how much time our engineers could spend each cycle on working on tech investments. 
Um, to be honest, we kind of started kind of fairly cautiously and we suggested to our senior leadership that our engineers should spend 10% of their time on tech investment and 90% on product delivery. Um, ideally, we probably would have done kind of 20, 80, but because we were just starting out, we kind of wanted to be a bit kind of cautious about it. Um, and they agreed. So we had senior stakeholders in agreement. Um, we had um, agreement of the percentage time that our engineers could spend on it. Um, then we had to persuade our product managers. And this was really, 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 really tricky. Because your product managers, right, are the people who are on the hook for delivering value to your business and your customers. And every kind of week, they have to be accountable for the amount of value and are measured against their OKRs. And for us saying, hey, we want to take 10% of that time away and use it on tech investment was a really, really difficult sell. Um, so we did the following things. We reminded them or we convinced them that because we were taking away 10% of their engineering time to spend on tech investment, that we would also not expect them to deliver 100% of their product goals, right? So we told them, reassured them over and over again that 90% of their um, product goals were the, would be what they had to deliver, right? Not 100%. You can't take away 10% of time and then say, still got the same goals. Um, and that was the kind of reason we really need to get our kind of senior stakeholders um, on board to help persuade them as well. We told them that we wouldn't overload them. So if there was a team that had an extremely aggressive and critical uh, um, delivery um, to do uh, in a cycle, that we would not give them any tech investment. So we kind of made an accommodation for that. And we told them that we were going to iterate, that we would try this for one cycle, and that if they had a problem with it or we needed to kind of change at all, that we would do that. And we had to over communicate with them every step of the way about what we were doing. So then they agreed, and that was amazing. So we had our senior stakeholders, we had the amount of time, and we had our product managers, all good. We were good to go. So the next step of this was to put our plan into action to embed our practices in our normal uh, workflow. Um, so we went into a cycle of planning. So at Accurex, we have um, uh, two monthly cycles. So uh, kind of all of our product planning is done on a two monthly cycle, uh, sets of OKRs for two months and so on and so on. Um, we wanted to have exactly the same cycle for our tech investment, but we kind of shifted it kind of two weeks earlier than product planning. So what do we do? We got all the right people in the room to go start the planning session. So um, we, our VP of engineering, our tech directors, any people who were kind of subject matter experts on any of our kind of critical pieces of tech investment. So we had some senior front end engineers in there as well. We got them all into the room and we had the list. <coughs> we wanted to prioritize the work. So we had this kind of very, very long list of tech investment. Um, we wanted to prioritize it. So we kind of spent a whole bunch of time prioritizing that list. And there were kind of some tasks that were obviously more pressing than others. So for example, um, uh, tools that were coming to end of life that would no longer be supported. Um, areas of the code base that were kind of actively worked on that needed refactoring badly, um, areas of the code base that um, caused uh, uh, frequent user problems because they were kind of too complex, they were difficult to monitor. Um, those things all rose to the top of our list. We had a prioritized list. Then we uh, wanted to kind of size up a cycle's worth of work. And the way we did that was we got our kind of senior um, engineers to size each line item. Uh, we um, knew what kind of, how many engineering days we had in our budget, so kind of 10% of all engineering time. And we kind of counted down from the kind of top of our list. And when we got to that number of engineering days, we just drew a line and that was us, we had our backlog. And then there was a kind of quite an interesting process of matching. So obviously when you go into product planning, you already have a team and they're kind of working on a product and you just need to work out the scope of it. But we basically had, you know, 10 teams and a backlog and we need to figure out 
who were the best placed teams to do that work. We did several things. We considered several things. We wanted to be kind of considered in the way that we did this. First thing we thought about, so we had our list of tech investment. We had our list of product teams and we kind of every cycle, we kind of stack ranked in order of um, who has got the kind of highest priority work of our product teams. We also had a list of all the engineers in each product team. Um, so the first thing we did is we took account of urgent delivery um, uh, 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 deadlines, that was it. So if a team had a deadline that was very, very urgent, we didn't give them any tech investment in that cycle. Uh, we looked at the skills of the team. So some teams had, you know, somebody had a, a senior engineer who was on paternity leave and was, the team was just left with junior engineers or another team might have had no front end engineers. So we kind of mapped out the uh, tech investment depending on, you know, what the skills the team had. Next thing we did was um, we kind of aligned some of the tech investment with teams. So we said, okay, well, this kind of big refactor is in this part of the code base and that team own it. So obviously that kind of tech investment is going to sit over there. And finally, we kind of looked at all the development goals of the engineers and the team. So it might be that um, an engineer uh, um, was particularly, or, and the skills, the engineer was particularly interested in databases. We gave them a database upgrade to do. An engineer who was kind of trying to get to senior needs to work on an ambiguous problem. We think, oh, this is great. We can use this bit of tech investment, give it to that engineer. They'll be able to kind of prove um, uh, that they're kind of uh, working towards senior and that will be kind of useful for us. So that's what we did. That's the way we did it. We kind of matched all of those bits of tech investment to the different teams. Uh, and then we um, got all the tech leads and the product managers of the teams in a room and we said, this is our plan. This is the tech investment. Is there any pushback? Do you all agree? That was great. Um, they almost all agreed with everything. And then the last thing we did um, in this process of planning was we then took the um, cards from our tech investment list and we put them into the product team's own backlogs. The next thing we've done, we've kind of given them to the teams to kind of uh, put in their backlogs and then we wanted to empower them uh, to work on them themselves. And this really weird thing happened. We gave them their tech investment and then they turned around to us and they said, um, do we have to do the tech investment at the start of the cycle? We do it at the end of the cycle. Does it matter which engineer does which bit? I mean, they asked us so many questions about how to do them. It was really interesting. And then we just said, it's your tech investment. You do it the way you want to. It's really up to you to deliver it. All we want is that you deliver it by the end of the cycle. The thing that was really important, I think that the thing that makes this whole process work is that we wanted to have the whole team be held to account for delivering what we had set out to deliver. And the way we did that was we made the teams know that the senior management and the whole company expected them to deliver the tech investment. Now at Accurex, we have, um, as I said, we have kind of two month cycles. And within that two month cycles, we have kind of three check-ins with the senior leadership team where each project uh, product team goes in to uh, meet with the senior leadership team and they can give them update on their um, uh, progress towards their OKRs. And we wanted to include tech investment in those check-ins. And so that's what we did. So we spent 20 minutes of a check-in on product delivery. Uh, and then we spent the kind of the last kind of five or 10 minutes um, with the senior leadership team asking uh, the product team how they got on with their tech investment and were they kind of moving towards their goals. And it made everybody in the product teams confident that this was a priority for us as an organization and that it was a kind of first class citizen, if you like, in kind of moving uh, in working. So we did that. And then the last thing we did is celebrate. Uh, we wanted to celebrate bringing tech investment out of the shadows. It had been a thing that nobody talked about, nobody cared about. And, and in fact, we'd never ever celebrated doing a piece of tech investment. In our Slack channels, we're full of teams going, yay, we shipped this product to the feature, uh, to, the, to our users. We shipped this feature to our users. We had never said, yay, we refactored this large area of code. Um, but we wanted to kind of consistently do that. And so, um, we kind of made a habit of always kind of calling out when we delivered a big bit of tech investment. 
and it was doubly good. Engineers felt good about doing it, um, product managers were on board, and we also got to talk about why we were doing that tech investment and why it was important at the same time. Oh, that was it. Okay, so has it worked? Um, yes. Um, we've got a through a fair bit of our tech investment. Um, we're about to kind of count it up and see how we've done. Um, we, uh, uh, teams embraced it. Um, they kind of started talking about it and, and product managers said, why aren't you doing that refactoring rather than why are you doing that refactoring, which is music to my ears. Um, engineers felt empowered to do it. They didn't feel guilty. They didn't feel like they need to do it secretly. Um, everybody knew what was being worked on all of the time. So there was more trust between product managers and engineers. And it helped our engineers with their career progression. What hasn't worked well? It's a bit top down, if I'm, if I'm honest. It's the same people who are kind of adding to the kind of big tech investment list. And it's the same people who are um, divvying out the tech investment. We would like um, our teams to be more involved in saying, we want to do this. Still uh, something that we need to work on. And that's kind of our next iteration of it, really. And a weird thing, we had some engineers um, move mid-cycle and we had some teams change focus mid-cycle. And so we kind of qu quite kind of figured out what happens with tech investments if that happens. But it's kind of quite a small problem, really. Okay, so that was it. We're nearly there. Um, uh, I've got some final thoughts on how to avoid accumula accumulating debt. And although um, this uh, guy last night did say to me, how can we not have any debt? You can't. Um, but there are some things you can do to kind of avoid um, adding what uh, is sometimes called uh, reckless debt. So good habits. Uh, don't always compromise. Um, you know, th there is a trade-off, obviously, between fast and perfect, but let's not always err on the side of super fast. Give your engineers time to think. Uh, document your trade-off. So if you are working on a product that has to be shipped really fast and you're making a lot of technical trade-offs, for goodness sake, write them down. Because if you're working at pace, you might just move on to the next thing and before you know it, you've forgotten what trade-offs you need to do, what refactors you said you'd do. Either write them down in a document or document them in the code. Um, use lean UX methods. Um, not everything has to be built by an engineer in order to test it. So when you're working fast and you're doing a lot of discovery, you can use lean UX. You can use Wizard of Oz tests and, uh, and, and fake door tests and prototyping and wireframes. You don't always have to build the thing in order to, um, in order to just throw it away um, or not throw it away um, a few weeks later when you realize it's not needed. Invest in knowledge, write things down, document your technical choices, your architecture choices, your style guides, your engineering principles, just write things down. Upgrade your technologies. For goodness sake, make a spreadsheet of all your tools and your, uh, and, and your libraries and uh, write what versions you're on, write what versions are gonna be end of life and when, and set alerts and alarms so you don't get caught out. Keep your tech investment list up to date. And uh, finally, um, reward continuous improvement. So we've put a big section in our career framework for engineers um, that will calls out good behaviors in terms of kind of continuous improvement of uh, code. Um, let them know that it's good to, uh, to keep refactoring. Okay, and here we are, we're finished. Um, we can finally go to the pub. The conclusion is, um, the aim of my talk was to convince you the success of your business relies on you at all, not just engineers, caring about technical debt and finding ways to reduce it as a company and as a team. I talked about what technical debt is and uh, how it's inevitable. I talked about some types of tech debt. I talked about very visible manifestations of tech debt. And I talked about the impact of tech debt, uh, um, it being uh, to your business, it being slow to market, creating attrition, having unreliable services. 
And I talked about some sustainable ways of reducing it by uh, having a backlog, incorporating it into your software development lifecycle. But if I take away, if you take away one thing from this talk, please, I'd love you to take away the fact that tech debt is a business problem, not a technical problem. Thank goodness I can see some people nodding. That's great. Um, tell your business why you need to reduce it and make a plan to reduce it. And if you do, Leon, Anna, Christina, and I will all thank you. Your CTO will thank you. Your customers will thank you. And your shareholders and uh, investors will thank you too. Thank you. I, did, I didn't say uh, questions, but I'd prefer not to. I'm sure you'd all prefer to go to the pub. So um, if anybody wants to call me, call me separately, uh, you can, or um, I'm on Twitter, please do talk. And when I put these slides up, there's some resources at the end if you want to see those as well. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Sally.